uh, what we've been receiving from the Lord and from each other. So I'm excited about uh, the chance this afternoon uh, to be a part of the panel. Uh, but I wanted to talk uh, this afternoon and, uh, uh, about um, what is the theological uh, value that we need as we engage in missions and as we engage in this changing world we've been talking about throughout this weekend. And I want to do it through the lens of a book that most of you have probably not either read or ever heard a sermon series on. How many of you have ever heard a sermon series? Not just one sermon, but a sermon series on the book of Lamentations. <laughs> All right, one or two of you, that's about right. In a gathering of about a couple of hundred people, you'll have one or two individuals. Most of you have heard one sermon, and that's the Lamentations chapter 3, verse 21, 22, and following, which is the one positive verse in the entire book of Lamentations. That's the sermon that we have all uh, heard. Um, I, I, I uh, wanted to engage in this book because what I found uh, in my, my last book, the book that I just finished writing, uh, it took five years to write that book. Uh, it's a comment in the book of Lamentations called Prophetic Lament. It came out in September. My wife said, you work five years, you're going to sell about four copies. Because who wants a book on Lamentations of all things? Why are you picking that book of the Bible to write? And the, the problem is that most have not heard of that book or have engaged that book. Um, it's actually absent in the worship life of the American congregation. Um, uh, Dean uh, Denise Hopkins, who's an Old Testament professor at Wesley Seminary in Washington, D.C., did a survey of the uh, liturgical traditions in the United States. And that would include the Catholics, the Anglicans, the Methodists, the Lutherans, those who follow a liturgical calendar and liturgical readings in their worship life. And she found that, by and large, the lament psalms, the psalms that speak about lament, are usually left out of the worship life of the liturgical church. Uh, Glenn uh, Pemberton did a study on the worship life of uh, Presbyterian and Baptist and Disciples of Christ, Churches of Christ, and found that if you look at the Psalms, of the 150 Psalms, about 40% of those Psalms are lament Psalms, Psalms that talk about suffering, and 60% of the 140, 150 are Psalms of praise or celebration. And uh, if you look at the typical Baptist hymnal or the Presbyterian hymnal, only about 15% of those hymns would be considered lament songs. So disproportionately underrepresented. Now that actually doesn't even take into account how many of those songs we sing, right? So even if only 15% of those hymns are lament, we probably sing less than that in terms of our everyday worship life as a congregation. Um, so I took that same metric and tried to ask the question of what percentage of our contemporary worship songs would qualify as lament songs. So every year, CCLI, the Christian Copyright Licensing something or another, uh, uh, if you ever see uh, words projected onto a screen, worship songs, at the bottom you're supposed to have this little tiny word that says CCLI and then like a seven or eight digit number next to it. And it's to uh, keep track of the songs that are saying that are not in your hymnals, that are, not, uh, that are copyrighted through the CCLI licensing. So I don't know if you know this, but churches are supposed to report on the songs that they sing. So every year, every uh, few months or so, they're supposed to write to CCLI and say, we sang the following five songs, sang the following six songs. So they actually keep a track of the most popular worship songs that are sung on a typical weekend in a Christian church. And so every year in August, they publish the top 100 worship songs, contemporary worship songs that are sung. How many of you say, just like in the Bible, that top 100 list, 40% of those songs are songs of lament? 40%? How about just like in the Presbyterian hymnal, 20, 15 to 20% of those top 100 popular Christian songs are songs of lament? Do I hear 15%? Do I hear 10%? Well, by my estimation, I went through all the lyrics of these top 100 songs. About five of those songs would qualify as what we would call lament songs. And I'm using the word lament in the most generous terms imaginable. <laughs> I cry out. Yes, a lament song. The rest of it is, I cry out for joy. It's okay. The word cry. Still in there. I'm still counting it. But even with these very generous ideas of lament, you'll find less than 10% of our typical contemporary Christian worship songs deal with the theme of suffering and lament. So what I'm arguing for here is that there's something missing in our theology. There's something missing in our worship life. There's something missing in our teaching life when lament is conspicuously absent 
from our dialogue, from our conversation, from our teaching, and from our worship life. So I, I compare it in this way. Um, like uh, many of you, I made New Year's resolutions. How I many of you made New Year's resolutions January? Some of you have already broken those resolutions, or some of you are still keeping them up. I made a resolution like I've done for the last 10 years since I turned 40. Um, I made a resolution that I was going to stay a little more fit and lose a little weight this upcoming year. I'm not going to see a show of hands, but I know many of us might have made that same resolution. Be a little more fit. Uh, and, and be a little healthier this upcoming year. Now, as a professor, one of the things I do is I research and said, how can I be the best fit condition I can be in this upcoming year? I go online, I look for the best fitness program that's out there, and I find out it's something called CrossFit. And you heard of this? PX90 is another name for this, CrossFit. And the idea of CrossFit is something called muscle confusion. <laughs> muscle confusion, that's the whole the concept behind CrossFit. And I saw this thing and said, this is perfect, because this is what I've been doing to my body for years. <laughs> so the way I apply muscle confusion is I don't work out for like three, four months in a row. And then when I go to the gym, my muscles are really confused. What are you doing? Why are we not supposed to be here? So the idea is that sometimes fitness requires disruption. It requires confusion. That health, might require a change of process or program, and it disrupts our normal form and function and course of activity. And that's what lament is. It is a confusion. It is a disruption to the status quo. And it challenges us to move beyond our comfortable places in order to engage a narrative that is very different from our own. And so Lamentations is just that. At the moment in Israel's history, at the people of God's history in the Old Testament, you're supposed to come in with a triumphant narrative or a successful narrative. Instead, we get lament, a holy disruption and holy confusion. So we're going to look at Lamentations chapter 1, verses 1 and following. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to it. If not, we'll have it flashed up on the screen there. I'll read verses 1 through 3 and give the context of what's happening in the book of Lamentations. How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. How like a widow is she, who was once great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. Verse 2. Bitterly she weeps at night. Tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, there is no one to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. And finally, verse 3, after affliction and harsh labor, Judah has gone into exile. She dwells among the nations. She finds no resting place. And all who pursue her have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, remind us of what the people of God are confronted with in the book of Lamentations. Most of you know the story. Uh, Jerusalem told the blind, the lame, and the sick. They're the only ones that are left in the city of Jerusalem. And that's why you see this image in Lamentations 1, verses 1 and following, of this broken, devastated city, deserted city, a widow, uh, had, has become a slave, uh, weeping at night, tears are on her cheeks, no one to comfort, everybody has betrayed her, everybody has become an enemy, talks about affliction and harsh labor, being sent away into exile in the midst of her distress. This is a story of complete devastation for the people of God here in the book of Lamentations. Now, what happens here, and uh, you can, if you want to take a quick look at the screen here, is that there are three potential responses that the people of God have to this devastation. The first is to say, we're done. We're destroyed. We don't want to have anything to do with the world around us. The second is to say, we're going to fix this problem, and we're going to do it our way. The third is to enter into the practice and discipline of lament. Those are the three options that we encounter in the book of Lamentations and in the book of Jeremiah. We're either going to give up and say we're done, we don't want to have nothing to do with anything that's going on in the world around us, or we're going to give in to the world around us, or the proper response, which is the response of lament. Let's look at that first potential response in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 4 and following. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Marry, have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Verse 7, also 
Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Very famous verse, verse 7 is the one that most of you recognize. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Now 99% of the time in the Old Testament, every time you see the formula, seek the peace, what city comes after that? Seek the peace of Jerusalem. Very common formula all over the Bible. Seek the peace of Jerusalem. Seek the peace and prosperity to Shalom of Jerusalem. In this verse, it says something completely off the wall. Not seek the peace and prosperity of Jerusalem, but seek the peace and prosperity of Babylon. Of all the crazy ideas in the world. Jerusalem, of course, is heavenly city, God's city, David's city. But now you're called to seek the peace and prosperity of Babylon, the symbol of all that is wrong with the world. Here's what one of the tendencies when we are confronted with change in the world. We talked about some of these changes this morning. When there are changes in the demographics of American society, when there are changes in the center of Christianity, one of the things that we might be tempted to is to run away and hide and say we no longer want to have anything to do with the world that is changing out there, with the city that is changing out there. We're going to run away and hide. And this passage says you do not have that option. You do not have the option to run away and hide. You do not have the option to go away and go off and build your nice buildings and have your nice communities and have your nice small groups but not engage the world around you. That is not an option for the people of God. So in the midst of this incredible destruction and suffering and chaos, God says you are not to run away and hide. The truth though is that if you look at American religious history, one of the things that the church has done well is run away and hide. In the 19th century, we saw Christianity very much engaged in the world around us. Christians were the ones that brought changes in child labor laws. Christians were at the forefront of the abolitionist movement. Christians were actually at the forefront of women's rights. The women's rights movement came from meetings in church basements of women who recognized that they were made in the image of God and appealed for the right to vote in society. These major, powerful, positive social change movements occurred in the context of the church. It was the church that led the way in social change. However, in the 20th century, that narrative changes ever so slightly. And the church, instead of being at the forefront of social change, begins to run away and hide from the world around them. One of the ways that's very most evident in the way that the church left urban centers and decided to move into suburban communities. Because the cities, which had been portrayed as cities set on a hill, new Jerusalems and new Zions, something strange was going on to those cities. Immigrants were coming into those cities. African Americans were moving into those cities. Immigrants not from Western and Northern Europe, but immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. And these immigrants were not Western European Protestants. They were Italian Catholics. They were Greek Orthodox. They were Eastern European Jews. And all of a sudden, these urban centers, which were supposed to be the bastion for white Anglo-Saxon Protestantism, now had Catholics and Jews and Orthodox Christians and it changed what people perceived of the city. Uh, if any of you saw the movie Gangs of New York, uh, uh, DiCaprio, uh, D Daniel Day-Lewis, I saw it many, many years ago. I was so confused throughout most of this movie. Because on the cover of the DVD it said, this is a movie about a race war in New York. I'm saying, DiCaprio's white and so is Daniel Day-Lewis. How is this a race war? There are two white people fighting in a race war. Why was that? Because it was the old immigrants who were from Western and Northern Europe versus the new immigrants who were from Southern and Eastern Europe. And these are kind of the things that are played out in major urban centers. In fact, the tone of how the church starts viewing the city begins to change. I was looking at one uh, particular um, uh, denominational journal. And instead of cities being great places where people could gather, it began to be portrayed as well, uh, this is the actual words, caves of run new urban centers in the north. Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. These cities began to change overnight almost from predominantly white cities to cities with a huge influx 
of African Americans. And what's the narrative that begins to develop about cities? Cities were once Jerusalem's. Cities were once the places where churches would flourish. Big buildings built in these cities and urban neighborhoods. Once the Eastern Europeans, Southern Europeans moved in, once the African Americans moved in, most of the white Protestants left. It's the narrative of white flight. Most left to build Christian colleges in the suburbs. Most left to build mega churches in the suburbs. They fled. Not only fleeing, fleeing the city, but say we reject the culture around us. And that's when you start seeing the advent of a subculture because people have fled the culture around them and disengaged from the world around them. Subcultures like Christian, um, Christian music replacing secular music. And Christian music which is usually a lot worse than secular music. <laughs> How many of you are, are remember in your youth group years receiving a sheet of paper from your youth pastor and at the top it said, sounds like. And it said, if you like this secular band, this Christian band sounds like them. So if you liked Black Sabbath, <laughs> if you liked Judas Priest, you will like this Christian band that sounds like this secular band. So I would rush out with my hard-earned money and my $12 and buy my vinyl LP of this Christian band that supposedly sounded like the secular band. And do they sound like that secular band? Absolutely not. I wasted $15 of my hard-earned money because they never sound like the actual secular band they're trying to say. So what you're trying to build is this subculture that is an alternative to the secular culture. But we do it very poorly. So Christian music is not as good as secular music. Christian art is not as good as secular art. But we have all these Christian subculture versions of what's going on in the world out there. So one of the most ridiculous examples of this is when I was in high school, one of the more popular t-shirts was a t-shirt that was a Budweiser King of the Beers, King of Beers t-shirts. I don't know how you remember, like these teenagers to show how cool they are would wear these t-shirts that says Budweiser King of, the Be King of Beers. And some entrepreneur Christian said, that's not good, we need to change that. So the logo looks exactly the same. The emblem is the same, color scheme is the same. It just said, Jesus, King of the Jews, instead of Budweiser, King of Beers. <laughs> so now you're getting a Christianized version of what's out there in secular society. In other words, we were running away and hiding. We were running away and hiding. And probably the best example of this for me is in architecture, where church buildings, as churches began to flee the city, flee into the suburbs, flee the world around them, they began to build church buildings that look like this, sanctuaries that look like this. Now, when was this sanctuary built? Probably pretty recently, right? In the, what would be the 50s and 60s. Now, you'll see this a lot more in the Midwest and in the East Coast. I don't see this so much in California. But in the Midwest, you'll see all these sanctuaries that look like this. So it's a common sanctuary where you have kind of the slant roof, slanted roof and a little bit of an arch on the side. You can see that, right? A little bit of an arch on the side. Now, I was at a building dedication in the late 1970s of a building that was built just like this. And it was in a cold weather climate uh, area. And I was, I was like, whose idea was it to build this sanctuary like this? Because it was dedicated in the very cold weather. It was like in January and the building was being dedicated. And what happens on a cold January day in a cold climate? What happens to all the heat? The vents that are on the floor, where does all the heat go? Right up into the rafters. So you've got a lot of hot air up there and the frozen chosen, literally, <laughs> down on the floor. And so now what do you need to do to even out the heat? What do the churches have to build to push that heat down? Ceiling fans, and now you've got ceiling fans and charismatics can't worship at your church anymore because they'll hit their hands on the ceiling fans. So you end up with a form of architecture that just doesn't make sense. Why are you building buildings, especially in cold weather northern and northeastern cities, that just architecturally doesn't make sense? So I'm at this building dedication. I must have been nine years old. I'm thinking this in my head. This is the stupidest building I've ever seen. I can't believe we spent millions on this building. And then the pastor describes why we built this building this way. And he says, I want you to imagine this entire building turned upside down. So look at the picture. If you see the building completely turned upside down. He says, what do you see? And he says, you are looking at the bottom of a ship, of a boat. Our sanctuary is a ship. It's a boat. And he began to explain where in the Bible 
do you hear about a really big boat? <laughs> Noah's Ark. So if it's upside down, it's Noah's Ark. And if it's right side, if you go to the next slide, then it's the church sanctuary. <laughs> what you have is Noah's Ark. Now tell me what message you're sending to the world when your church is Noah's Ark. <laughs> we want to have nothing to do with you. We don't care about the world out there. As long as we're safe in Noah's Ark, and we got our Christian music, our Christian art, our Christian coloring books, our Christian underwear, you name it, we've got a Christian version of it. As long as we're safe here in Noah's Ark, we don't care what happens to the world out there. I gotta ask you, how do you do evangelism from Noah's Ark? Not very well. Now, Uncle Joe is floating by. You throw out a life raft and say, Hey, Uncle Joe, come on aboard. We love you, Uncle Joe. We're so glad you're here. Your family, we have space for you on this raft. We're on this boat. But then, your neighbor floats by and you go, Ooh. You know, he borrowed my mower about two weeks ago. He hasn't given it back yet. And you know, we're not quite sure he's going to fit the culture of this ark. We have a pretty specific culture. We like to sing songs a certain way, and we would like to make sure that our coffee hour is exactly 59 minutes, and he might push that coffee hour to an extra five minutes, and we're not comfortable with that. So we're pretty certain there's another arc down the way that's more for his kind of people. And so evangelism becomes, we'll bring people that are going to be comfortable with us into our boat, but we'll let the others go and find other boats along the way. And so we have created a system and structure and way of thinking at the world. We say, we are disconnected from the world. As long as we're safe in Noah's Ark, that's what we want to be. But the scripture challenges us. That is not a choice that you have. You are not to run away and hide. Instead, you are to seek the peace and prosperity of all places of Babylon. Seek the peace and prosperity of Babylon. So God rejects that first option. We are not to run away and hide. But then the second option is found in Jeremiah 29, verses 8 and 9. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them. So there are two words here. One is prophet, and clearly based upon the next verse there, we're talking about false prophets. False prophets who were telling the people what they wanted to hear. Now, the way that prophecy and uh, false prophecy and idolatry works, the best comparison I can think of is think of a vending machine. You go up to a vending machine and you put in, what is it, like $5 for a soda now? <laughs> you put in all those dollar bills or even you can swipe your credit card, and then they have these numbers, these bank of numbers, and you punch in the numbers corresponding to the item that you want, right? So you want a Diet Coke and you push J4, and out comes a Diet Coke. That's the way vending machines are supposed to work. You ask for what you want, you get what you want. Now, if you push J4 and the corresponding number is Diet Coke and a Sprite comes out, oh man, no, 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 that's not the way this is supposed to go. And there is a 1-800 number you can call to say, whoa, oh, no, 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 that's not the way these vending machines are supposed to work. Because there are rules governing that vending machine. You put the right amount of money in, you ask for the right product, you're supposed to get that exact product. And for idolatry, in the ancient Near East, and for many Christianity in the United States right now, it operates like a vending machine. We go to worship at the temple of the idol to get exactly what we want. We want crops that are flourishing this year. Well, the temple idol will tell you, will say, well, offer this temp uh, sacrifice and you'll get exactly what you want. Well, I want to have a son born down to this family this year. The temple idol will say, well, offer this type of sacrifice and you'll get exactly what you want. And is that the way we operate? To say, there are magic formulas we can follow. And that's where the word divination comes in. The idea of divination is that there is a secular magic formula you can follow to get exactly what you want. To follow the ways of the world. And one of the things that I research is the area of church growth and how churches grow. And one of the most profound disappointments in the last 50 years of church growth study and church growth ministry is that we have equated the homogenous unit principle with church growth and said, if we get together people that look like us, then our churches will grow. Uh -huh. And actually it will work because sociologically, birds of a feather do flock together. 
We want to hang out with people that look just like us, act like us. We don't want people to rock the ark. We want the people that are going to fit in with us. So that's the kind of churches that we built based upon the homogenous you know, principle. And does it work? Absolutely. It's a magic formula that works. It's just not in the Bible. <laughs> it's a great sociological concept. Yes. It's a great practical way of growing anything. You find a market segment and you exploit that market segment. You could do that with churches. You can do that with hot dogs. You can do that with, with uh, cell phones. That's all part of a marketing principle. It's just not in the Bible. So we have bought into the world system of false prophecy, idolatry, and divination. And this passage tells us that is not an option for you either. So what is God calling us to do? God is calling us to engage the practice of lament. To engage the power of lament. Eight different characteristics in Lamentations 1, 2, and 4 that reflect this idea of a funeral dirge. It's a subset of the larger genre of lament. But there is a distinction between the funeral dirge and the larger genre of lament, or something like the individual lament. Think of an individual lament as if you have a friend who's in the hospital, and you do a pastoral visit. And the person is in pain, so you pray a lament with that person. But the person is still alive, and you're praying for the hope that that person might get better. That's a legitimate way of praying a lament. The person is sick, we want to pray for that person to get better. That would be a way of looking at individual lament. A funeral dirge, circumstances are completely different. The person is no longer in the hospital. The person is dead. There's a dead body in the room. There's a dead body right in front of you. And it's time to have a funeral for the dead body. In fact, it's, it's inappropriate for people to come up and say, no, we believe the person's gonna come back to life right now. Everybody gather around, we're gonna take him out of his coffin and, and lift him up and prop him up. No, that would be completely inappropriate. That would be weird to have something like that happen because when there's a funeral, there's a dead body and it's appropriate time to have a funeral. One of the applications for me is that our history in the United States and our story as the church there are dead bodies littering our history. And we ignore those dead bodies. Because almost every single time we see a dead body in our history, it's the dead body of a person of color. It's the dead body of a Native American who is slaughtered as European settlers want to move further and further west. It's the dead body of those who died on the Trail of Tears as we forced migration of Native Americans from the Southeast further and further west. It's the dead body of slave labor stolen from Africa, thrown overboard so that the sharks could devour them. It's the dead body of those who are killed uh, uh, on the plantations, whipped and beaten within an inch of their lives. It's the bodies of women abused sexually, physically, emotionally, complete abuse of women on the plantation. Our history is littered with dead bodies. And yes, it is the dead body of Michael Brown. It is the dead body of Eric Garner. It is the dead body of Tamir Rice. It is the dead body of those nine people who gathered for a Bible study and prayer meeting and went gunned down in the church. It is the dead body of four little girls in a church in Birmingham, Alabama. It is the dead body of person after person after person. Sandra Bland, Laquan McDonald, Rakia Boyd. The names go on and on and on and we cannot ignore the dead bodies in the room. If we're going to have genuine reconciliation, we can no longer ignore the dead bodies in the room. A quick background for us, uh, as, as uh, uh, Sister Brenda mentioned, we were in Ferguson together uh, in December of the year before, uh, right around the time, uh, right at the time when the Eric Garner uh, non-verdict came in. And I remember we were going through the city of, uh, of Ferguson. Ferguson, as many of you know, is a first ring suburb right outside of St. Louis. And uh, we were going over the history of what happened in St. Louis. And for example, many of you know that Missouri, the, the, have heard of uh, the Missouri Compromise. And the Missouri Compromise was, it allowed Missouri, which was a slave state, to come into the Union, to allow slavery to continue in the Union. That was the compromise. It would take Missouri, it would take them as a slave state, but it would also mean that slavery would continue because we took Missouri into the Union. So Missouri was the place that perpetuated and allowed slavery to exist for several more years. 
Uh, St. Louis is, is also the place where you can see the great archway. You go to St. Louis now, one of the huge landmarks is an archway. And anybody know which direction it faces? It faces west. It faces west. It's part of that little huge narrative of what we now call manifest destiny. The idea that the European settlers had every right and even a responsibility and even a destiny to go and conquer the rest of the continent, no matter who was already there, we're just going to take it over. And that arch is a symbol of the American people looking westward and saying, our destiny is to take over this entire continent. We don't care how many people we kill along the way. And millions die as that archway points us towards the west. We also know that the Dred Scott decision, a federal court case, was handed down in St. Louis, at the federal courthouse in St. Louis. The Dred Scott decision essentially said, black lives do not matter. Doesn't matter whether you're free or slave, you do not have the rights. You do not exist the way a white life matters. Black lives do not matter in St. Louis. So you take all of these variables together, this history, these dead bodies in the room, does it not make sense that the cry for black lives do matter emerges out of this narrative? A story where over and over and over again, history has said, you do not matter in our society. You do not matter in our country. You are a dead body that should be left out there as Michael Brown's body was left out there for four and a half hours in a hundred degree weather. Your body does not matter. It was said with the Missouri Compromise. It was said with the Archway in St. Louis. It was said with the Dred Scott decision. And it was said when a dead body was left out in the roasting 100 degree summer August heat for four and a half hours. The church needs to change that narrative. We need to acknowledge there are dead bodies in the room. And we need to enter into that place of lament to say, God, we have sinned. God, we have allowed this sinfulness to go on for too long. God, we have allowed too much separation, segregation, too much conflict along racial lines. God, we as a church have not been the reconcilers, and that's why there are dead bodies in the room now, even as we speak. God, forgive us. We lament this brokenness in our history. So we are called to this moment of lamentation to cry out to God, Lord, we have failed. We have not done everything right. But Lord, we need you to intervene into this narrative. But here's the good news out of this. In the process of lamenting, we don't lose, we gain. See, sometimes when we talk about history and the past and the, uh, the very, very harmful racial history, people get really nervous and say, well, it, well let's talk about the good things instead. Let's not talk about the bad things. We don't need to dwell on the negative. Let's just dwell on the positive. What, you, what we fail to realize is that lament is redemptive for us. We gain, not lose. And the way this has been uh, pointed out to me is by the work of Walter Brueggemann in his work Shalom. Um, and uh, his, 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 he has a version of the book called Peace. And the earlier work is called Shalom. Don't buy both those books. They're the same book. I actually made the mistake of buying, oh, he's got one book on peace and one book on Shalom. Great, I'll buy both. It's the same book. They just changed the title. So Walter Brueggemann has a book on peace. And he talks about what peace and Shalom, the Hebrew word Shalom, means for the haves and the have-nots. And that there's a difference between the Shalom for the haves and the shalom for the have-nots. If you look at the, the next slide, I've laid out for you on the left-hand column the, what the characteristics of the haves, and in the right-hand column, the characteristic of the have-nots. So these are using uh, Brueggemann's paradigms and saying, if you look on the left, those who have good things view the world differently. So if you have good things, your goal is to manage and steward the resources that you have. That makes sense. And if you have good things, you see the world as generally a good place. And because you have good things, life is already healthy, complete, and whole. And because of that, oftentimes images of God are maternal figure, nurturer, feminine, uh, giving good things and protecting the good things you already have. Now, if you are a half person who, as I'm, uh, the top says, you are in the theology of celebration. You celebrate the good things that you have. And because you have good things, you want to maintain the status quo. You want things to stay the same. You don't want tax rates to go up. 
You want interest rates to stay low to buy the house that you want. You want things to remain the way things are because you are flourishing in that status quo. Those are the haves who live in a theology of celebration. But the world also have the have-nots. And those who do not have these resources. So you're not managing, stewarding resources. You don't have resources. You're trying to survive. You're looking for God's salvation. The world is not a good place. It's actually an evil place. Life is not healthy and whole. Life is precarious. You need a deliverer. God is not nurturing. God it has to be a warrior who comes and smites the teeth and breaks the teeth of your enemies. That's where a lot of the imprecatory psalms come from, the idea of God as a warrior, because your life is in such dire straits that you need a God to come and be the warrior to save you. And you don't want the status quo. The status quo is destroying you. What you want to do is fight injustice. I think part of our missionary problem is that those of us who are in the theology of celebration over here assume that we've got all the answers and those who are over there in the theology of suffering do not have the answers. Uh -huh. We believe that the praise and all the good things we sing about, all the positives, are what makes us a great nation, a great church, to go out and fix all those lamenters and sufferers over there. But it turns out that both sides and communities desperately need each other. And in fact, your gospel is incomplete if you only have a celebration theology and not a suffering theology. I'll give you an example of this. Let's go to the richest neighborhood in Santa Barbara. We'll call it Santa Barbara. So we go to the richest neighborhood in Santa Barbara, and we go to a gated community, and we knock on the gate, and we somehow sneak in, and it's the largest house in this entire community. We knock on the door, and a 16-year-old answers the door. And we ask her, we're taking a survey of all the residents in this area, and we want to find out uh, what is heaven going to be like? Each plasma screen with all the hookup, that's what's gonna, that's gonna happen. So for this 16 year old who already has a lot of good things, heaven is more or amplified versions of the good things she already has. Because she dwells in a place of celebration, the celebration in heaven is gonna be just more of the good things she already has. But let's take that same question, but go to a very different context. Let's go to a refugee camp in Lebanon or in Turkey with the Syrian refugees, the millions who have lost their homes, who have been victims of a civil war that they had nothing to do with, who have lost everything, who are living in these tents and, 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 and struggling for everything in their lives. Let's find a 16-year-old girl and ask her the exact same question, what do you think heaven is going to be like? And she will give you a radically different set of answers. She'll say, heaven is nothing like the place I'm living in right now. Heaven is a place where there's actually food and water. Heaven is a place where my parents have not been beheaded by the, the terrorists in this region. Heaven is a place where I'm not worried about getting raped every night of my life. Heaven is nothing like the world I'm living in right now. Now, here's the crazy part about heaven, though. As far as I can understand, both the 16-year-old in Santa Barbara and a 16-year-old at a refugee camp, Syrian refugee camp, have got half the story. Because yes, heaven will be many of the great things here on earth, just amplified to the nth version, but heaven will also be like nothing we know in this world. And if we want a complete picture of heaven, you've got to talk to both the 16-year-old in Santa Barbara and the 16-year-old in the Syrian refugee camp. If you want the full picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've got to talk to someone who knows the victory of the empty tomb, but you've also got to talk to someone who knows the pain of a suffering on the cross. Without one or the other, without, with, with one excluded and not the other, you have an incomplete gospel. You have an incomplete understanding of Jesus. So when we talk about being involved in missions, when we talk about reconciliation, when we talk about the different ethnicities and cultures and groups becoming one in Christ, it is not that you are giving everything up. It is you have so much to gain. You have half the gospel as one steeped in the theology of celebration. You have half the understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. 
But when you encounter that person in the theology of suffering, in that place of lament, now the full gospel is made evident and clear. Now the fullness of understanding is made evident. That gospel, the gospel is not only a gospel of celebration, but it is also a gospel of suffering. It is not only a triumphant, victorious Jesus, but it is also the suffering servant, Jesus. Our theology is incomplete. Missions, reconciliation, allows us to encounter the fullness of the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would give us the privilege and the joy of encountering the full message of the gospel, that we might see not only the triumph, but also the suffering, that we would see not only what it means to follow you to great celebration, but to also stay in places of great suffering, to not only sing hymns of praise, but also hymns of lament. We pray, Lord, for the fuller understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We pray this in your name.